namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Bodhang Dhammang Sankhang Namasami So this is our half moon Wampra observance day. Uh, had a quiet day and now evening, an opportunity to practice together and to contemplate the teachings of the Buddha. And it's, a, it's very lovely to think of the community here gathered um, half of us here and half of us in different places around the monastery, but all of us with the intention to contemplate these teachings, this way of practice that is the uh, central part of, the central focus of all of our lives. It's the thing that uh, brought us here and that makes sense to us as a way of um, way of managing all of the ups and downs, the vicissitudes of of life, and we have these uh, bodies that we were born with, and uh, I was sitting on the steps of my kuti today, and just sort of. Really, very strong sense of just this body that's just part of nature. And looking out, there were the trees and the grass and the sky and the uh, earth. And just a real sense of just being part of all of that. Uh, and then this mind, of course. <laughs> that's what... Uh, um, presents another dimension. Uh, that's what uh, separates us, uh, and not not actually, but uh, in, that, that it, it's the um, the creation of our mind uh, that that makes us into a separate, special human being. And really one of the things that we're here for, or maybe the, the, the only thing that we're here for, is to really understand, to penetrate uh, the way that the mind does that, the ignorance of the mind. Uh, always making us separate, making us special, making us different, uh, setting us apart from nature, setting us apart from one another, uh, creating endless problems. <laughs> And uh, we're very fortunate that the Buddha uh, was born 2,500 years ago and presented a teaching that made sense to a great many people at that time and uh, presented it in a way that it could be easily transmitted, easily passed down over the generations, 2,500 years up to the present day. And uh, that we're we're still able to uh, have these teachings available, uh, to have brothers and sisters who we can live with who can support us on our journey to liberation. A very great blessing. The teaching I thought to contemplate this evening 
is a teaching that the Buddha gave to his uh, to Mahapajapati, who was the first nun. I was going to say to his stepmother or his foster mother, and, and that's how I've always thought of her, but actually that doesn't have a very nice connotation somehow. Uh, but thinking of her as the first nun is, is more uplifting. Uh, this remarkable woman who, um, after the Buddha's enlightenment, uh, about 500, uh, five years after the Buddha was enlightened, um, asked uh, if she could also um, go forth, leave the security, the comfort of the palace and the life that she, she knew, familiarity of the life that she knew, life of great privilege, and uh, live a life of austerity, a life of renunciation, in order to devote herself fully to practicing according to these teachings. Very remarkable. And there were many other women at that time who had a, uh, a similar aspiration, and, and they all walked after the Buddha. First of all, his initial response was to say, no, no, you, please don't ask. But uh, that's not going to work, was his first thought, his first response. But she obviously was very, very determined, and they, they made some kind of robes for themselves, set aside their palace finery, shaved off their hair, and walked something like 150 miles, I think, to, to Vesali, where the Buddha was, and asked again, and eventually he agreed. seems there were a great many women at that time who, who wanted to do this. And um, at one point, Mahapajapati said, look, I um, had a feeling of wanting to have a bit more solitude, practice on her own. And uh, so she went to the Buddha and, and asked him, you know, for some advice about how best to do this. And basically her question was one that I think many of us have. You know, how can I, how can I tell if I'm practiced correctly, if I'm practicing according to these teachings, to your teachings, to the Buddha's teachings? You know, what, what, what kind of um, things do I need to watch out for? What are the dangers? Um, and so Mahapajapati went and approached the Buddha bowed down, stood to one side, and the Buddha said, Mahapajapati, the things you need to watch out for, things you need to be careful about, questions you need to ask yourself. Uh, is my practice leading towards passion or to dispassion? Is it leading to being bound or free? Is it leading to self-aggrandizement and not to self-effacement? Is it leading to ambition and not to modesty? Is it leading to discontent and not to contentment? Is it leading to sociability and not to solitude? Is it leading to uh, indolence or putting forth energy? Is it leading to being a burden or easy to support? If you notice these things are happening, then you, need, then you can know, you can be sure that this is not the Dhamma, this is not the Vinaya, this is not what I teach, you're not following the correct way. And then he went through the whole list again in reverse. Is it leading to dispassion, to freedom, to being free, not bound? Is it leading to self-effacement, 
to modesty, to contentment, to solitude, to putting forth energy, to being easy to support. And with each of these, the Buddha said, yeah, this is right. This is what I teach. This is this what you, you're following the right way, the correct way. You know, please carry on practicing in that way. You're definitely going in the right direction. So I thought to talk a little bit about each of these uh, dhammas, these practices, these 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 things um, that we can notice about our practice. Uh, Just noticing, learning from the results. So that, you know, obviously living in community with, with other, other summoners, monks and nuns, other people who are practicing, uh, we can learn a lot just from observing each other. Uh, and we can be encouraged by each other's uh, practice and encouragement. Um, and we can also learn an enormous amount from just observing what's happening in our own heart. So what does it mean? Does it lead to passion and not to dispassion? What is dispassion? What does that feel like? What does passion feel like? Yeah. One way of um, contemplating it, I think, is well noticing uh, our response to different things that happen to us. Uh, and some of us, in fact, I think, well, not, not everybody, but one of the things that's been very, um, has generated a lot of passion in the last few days has been the uh, US elections. And... Uh, uh, I know for some people it's been quite an intense few days uh, and there are people who didn't even know it was happening uh, since we don't obviously have much access to, to the news, to the media, but for some of us we, we, were, we were aware and uh, there was a concern uh, and I'm sure all over America there's been huge amounts of concern. Uh, and we could call this passion, the kind of, the, the level of, of concern when, when the heart is really full and really um, kind of excited, there's a feeling of excitement. And when things are going well, we feel really jubilant, and really um, excited and happy and a tremendous energy of celebration. And then when things are not going so well, the sense of, despair, glum, despondent. And uh, it was interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm not American. I don't live in America, but I, I certainly have some views um, or had some views about this election. And I could, I could feel, you know, different bits of news that I, you know, each day I would hear something or other about it. And either I would feel, oh, oh, wonderful, or, oh, dear. <laughs> and... Uh, So what does it mean when about feeling like passion or dispassion? Um, like does dispassion mean that we don't care? Uh, does passion mean that we do care? Or is it more about the level of kind of equanimity or inner poise, inner balance that we bring to a, a situation like that? Uh, in my sense is that as we practice, uh, there's more of an evening out. So although we may care, we may feel disappointed if something doesn't go according to the way that we would like it to go, um, there's also a, a measure of, of equanimity, a measure of balance. Um, we're not absolutely devastated. 
or uh, enraged. You know, for some people, it's a matter of you know, very uh, strong, very potent feelings, and and we had a similar thing with the um, Scottish well, the rever referendum for independence. Similar thing about Brexit, and uh, you know the level of feeling was could be very very high. And, you know, caused a lot of division actually in the society, and. Um, Whereas when there's a sense of dispassion, you know, we may care, but there can be a, a kind of acknowledging that, you know, everybody has a different point of view, everybody has a different sense of it. And we don't have to hate the people who see things differently. We can just acknowledge that there's a, there's a difference. Um, you know, I feel more comfortable with this point of view, but, you know, I can, I can accept, I can appreciate that you have a different point of view. So there's a much more measured response to things. This is the, um, the benefit of this way of practice. It brings a, a steadiness into our lives. So we're not tossed around in the same way by the, um, the likes and the dislikes. Uh, the strength of feeling that come about can come about with these kind of events. Uh, and my sense is that the more people who are practicing at this time, the better, because you know, the whole the whole of America and the, you know, the people in this country, you know, there's a sense of um, arousal. And this is not always very helpful. The mind can get very hot and uh, quite unbalanced. So we don't have such an election every day, fortunately, but in the monastery there are things that can bring strong feeling, and people disagreeing with us, things not going the way that we would like, uh, things not working out. Um, people arriving. It was very sweet today watching the nuns greeting Sister Amara Siri, and obviously people very, very happy to see her. Uh, so there's some feelings of happiness and then feelings of uh, uh, sadness when, when somebody that we like uh, goes away or when somebody says something that we disagree with. You know, how, do we, how do we react internally? Is there a sense of arousal, a sense of anger or indignation? These are things we can notice. Not to blame ourselves or judge ourselves, but to say, okay, this is, this is a, something to watch out for. You know, am I able to respond to this thing that has been said that I strongly disagree with, uh, with more of a, 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 an inner calm, an inner balance? This life, this way of practice can bring, make us aware of, of very strong feelings. And uh, it can be uh, quite alarming sometimes to find out how much we mind about apparently very trivial things. Uh, get really upset about very small things. Um, but this is, this is what, we, what we can learn from, what we can observe. Does our practice lead us to being bound or free? Being bound to our views, bound to our opinions about how things have to be, bound to our likes and dislikes, bound to our duties, our responsibilities. Uh, and sometimes we feel, well, I shouldn't have any 
duties or responsibilities. In fact, in the Buddha's words on loving kindness, it says, you know, unburdened with duties, not, not bound by duties. But my understanding of this is more, you know, are these things that I can pick up and put down? Uh, pick them up when it's appropriate, put them down when it's not appropriate. So we're not constantly bound into a sense of responsibility, our position in the community, our, our role. Uh, can we pick it up when it's appropriate, fulfill the duty, the responsibility to the best of our ability, and then put it down? Our duty is to liberate the heart. Our duty is to cultivate a sense of lightness and joy rather than binding ourselves into all kinds of uh, duties and responsibilities. So we, we can pick them up as a, as a service, uh, something we offer to the community. And then we, uh, that's just something we do, a role we pick up, and then we put it down when it's not appropriate. Self-aggrandizement, self-effacement. Uh, sometimes when we have a lot of duties and responsibilities, we can um, really, uh, it can go to our head. We can feel rather very, uh, you know, that we're, we're very important. Uh, important position sitting up here, very important position, uh, giving a Dhamma talk, very important, and I can... Uh, feel really... You know, everybody has to treat me in a special way because I'm doing this. Uh, but that's not the way of the Buddha. The Buddha was always giving teachings, uh, but he didn't expect any special treatment as a result of it. And he lived, you know, his life was always very, very simple. Simple arms bowl, simple robes, um, not expecting anything uh, special. In fact, the way that he spoke about himself was uh, quite impersonal. The Tagata, the one who is gone. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a special somebody. I'm just gone. Space. So it's not like um, you know a worldly uh, life that we're leading now. You know, we're living a life where we. As I said, we pick up roles, responsibilities, and we put them down. You know, we're summoners, we're uh, renunciants. Aspiration to just put it all down, to let it all go. Uh, rather than making a big thing about it, being, being puffed up or proud. So it's not that we um, dismiss the good things that we do. Um, and the Buddha talk, talked about like, making merit, you know, practicing generosity, um, you know, serving, doing good things as a source of merit, you know, as a way of encouraging ourselves. Uh, you know, so. But it, it, it's a different kind of thing from feeling proud. It's like a kind of warmth in the heart. And I think it's something that we've all experienced here because all of us have been generous, have been kind, have done good things. Have, we've all helped each other. And, uh, you know, when you see somebody who needs something and you, you're able to provide that, it doesn't kind of make you feel, I'm the greatest, but it's a kind of, it's a warm, happy feeling in the heart. It was very sweet. Yesterday we celebrated 
Ajahn Bodhipala's 80th birthday. And uh, just seeing the, the kind of the joy that she has uh, through having in the last 22 years been able to live as a nun and practice you know, incredible diligence, put a lot of effort and uh, serving, helping, and but it, it it's it's not a feeling of pride or, but it's a, just a feeling of joy in the heart of having lived her life well. So um, this is something we can contemplate. You know, is my practice leading to a sense of self-aggrandizement, you know, building myself up, making myself feel really big and important? Or self-effacement, uh, which is a very, very different kind of feeling. Uh, does it lead to ambition or to modesty? Uh, in mean, the monastic life, uh, within this tradition, is not you know we we just ad advance uh, through having been here for a long time. So, you know, being being the head of the line or, or something is not really something you aspire to particularly. It's just something that, that kind of happens if you if you stay long enough. Uh, so it's not like a like a big attainment. And maybe there is some kind of uh, maybe it does show a sign of kind of endurance or patience or something. But it's not it's not like uh, like a worldly uh, position, it's it's just what happens when you when you've been here for a long time. Uh, and taking on more precepts is actually putting making yourself more dependent. Uh, you might think it sort of is a, is a big thing to have more precepts, but it actually makes you more more dependent. Uh, can I be content with my life? Uh, can I be content with what I have? Can I be content with my, the, the food in my bowl? Actually living here, it's not difficult to be content with the food that we have each day. Uh, very, very well supported, very well provided for. Uh, can I be content with my lodging? With my clothing? Can I be content with um, just how how the monastery is uh, with my life here as a nun, as a lay person, as a monk. Uh, the way I'm treated. Sometimes we're not content. And plenty of times I'm not content. <laughs> and this is something to watch out for, something to, to learn from in our practice. This is one of the, the pointers that the Buddha gave to Mahapajapati. He said, you know, this is something to watch out for. You know, are you, is there a kind of inner grumbling, a kind of... Um, uh, Dissatisfaction. And perhaps the one thing that we that we're allowed to be dissatisfied with is you know, is if we um, And we can be dissatisfied with our practice. 
You know, maybe that maybe that's actually in some ways a good quality you know, to recognize that we have more more to do. Uh, we need to make to make keep making more effort. And I I tend to, in my own practice I tend to focus a lot on being content with it. <laughs> But sometimes I think maybe I need to actually consider, you know, is it all right? You know, am I, am I putting enough effort? You know, am I, am I being too comforting? You know, saying, it's all right, Chantasiri, don't worry. You're doing fine. <laughs> you know, sometimes we need to do that because we can get very stressed and anxious about our practice. You know, I feel we should be enlightened straight away right now. Um, so that's certainly there are times when that's appropriate, but um, uh, sometimes it's also appropriate to see. Well, actually, there's more to do. I need to put more effort. I need to, um, and you know, we we can we can recognize. And I've been editing a talk of Ajahn Bodhipala's, and she talks about her practice and how you know kind of effort she puts, like, oh yes, maybe, maybe I should do that, uh, put more effort. You know, so sometimes it's, it's important to, to not be too content with our practice, sometimes it's important to put more effort, and then other, other times it's appropriate to relax. Sometimes I feel like saying to Bodhipala, you know, maybe just, just relax, it's all right. <laughs> so it's about finding balance, really, isn't it, with our practice. Uh, but learning how to be content with what we're provided with, you know, the robes, the alms food, the shelter, the medicines, rather than always feeling that it's not good enough. Yeah. Wanting better, wanting, wanting more. So am I you know, content or discontent. Um, am I always looking for company? Uh, sociability. Is that is that a part of my life? Am I able to be alone? Yeah. What, what do I? How do I spend my time? Uh, you know, in the monastery there. Um, you know, living in community, we, we can um, find ourselves feeling a bit glum and going and looking for someone to chat to just because it makes us feel better. Uh, and this is, you know, understandable and sometimes it's completely appropriate, you know, particularly if you're looking for someone to, you know, encourage you in your practice. That's, that's quite suitable. But if you're always... Uh, looking for someone, you know, restlessly trying to find someone to chat with. Um, maybe that's something to to watch out for. You know, how is it when there's nothing to do? You know, no, no work, no, no puja, no, nothing in particular to do. You know, how how, how does it feel? Is there a kind of restless looking around for for someone to chat with, some way to distract ourselves, or? Am I able to actually just enjoy being alone, being quiet? You know, maybe do a bit of study, maybe meditate a bit, go for a walk, look at nature. You know, am I able to be alone? Or do I always need to be looking for someone to chat with? We can take that to an extreme as well. And you know, community is very interesting because um, sometimes, you know, when we live in community, we just feel totally averse to everybody else. We, we want to get away from them. Um, so the the seeking solitude can be from a from a place of aversion, negativity. You know, don't bother me. I'm doing my meta practice. Uh, I I want to be alone. I need to be alone. Um, but my sense is that that wasn't really what the Buddha was talking about. It's not like uh, running away from people because we can't stand uh, being around people. 
but more a sense of appreciating the uh, the beauty of solitude and and being alone, recognizing that this is what can really nourish us. But if somebody is in need, uh, if somebody is 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 um, struggling with something, needing our help. You know, are we willing to, to respond with kindness? It's interesting when I, um, sometimes when I have a very, very peaceful meditation, um, I can't bear to talk to anybody after that. I don't want to see anybody. I just want to keep my, um, my peace, my inner, my inner stillness and quiet. So there's a lot of aversion there, a lot of negativity. So I, 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 I now recognize that if my mind goes very, very peaceful in meditation, that's the time I need to be rather careful when I emerge from meditation, or when I come off retreat, you know, so that I don't carry that um, uh, aversion for, for my spiritual companions, my good friends, or, or anybody for that matter. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to respond if there's a need. But I'm not constantly looking around for people to help. Uh, but if there is something that's, that's required, I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to respond. And I've noticed this among you know, people in the community when I, when I, when I, when I note it, watch uh, I remember uh, actually just uh, earlier this year, it seems like a lifetime ago, when I was in India. And I had the good fortune to be able to visit Jetsuma Tenzin Pamo's monastery, Dongyu Gyatsal Ling, um, near, near um, Dharamsala. And uh, she was very generous with her time. And um, Sister Tejasar and I were there. No, sorry, Sister Kemaka and I were there. And she showed us all around the, the monastery. And we had a, a laywoman with us, a very lovely woman who'd come with us to, uh, to look after us. And um, she had mentioned to me earlier that she would really love to, to chat with Jetsuma, ask her about some things about her life. And uh, so Tenzin Palmer spent you know, quite a bit of time showing us the, the, the nunnery and um, talking to us about um, different aspects about how things work there and really putting a lot of energy in. And uh, at the end of our conversation, I said, oh, and um, would you be able to just have a little chat with this person who was with us? And it was interesting because I could see how, how tired she was actually having spent time with us and how she just kind of breathed in and said, yes, okay, come and we'll sit down and have a talk. And so although, you know, this is somebody who spent 12 years practicing in a solitary way in a cave in the Himalayas, not seeing anybody, somebody who obviously loved solitude, but there was a willingness to engage with this person who, who very much needed uh, some, some guidance about her life and her practice. So I was very touched, very inspired by that. Uh, so she uh, definitely loved solitude, but she was willing to engage when necessary out of compassion. Uh, so where are we up to now? Um, energy, yes. <laughs> Does my practice bring energy? Do I have energy to practice? Or am I always feeling too tired? Um, 
If I'm always feeling too tired, it may be that I have a vitamin deficiency or need some to think about my health. Perhaps there's some physical uh, basis for this. But um, I think probably for most of us, uh, if there's a feeling of, of indolence, not, not much energy, um, then maybe we um, need to just put forth a bit more energy, <laughs> um, apply ourselves um, a bit more. Uh, it can be so easy just to sort of think, oh, well, I'll just have a little rest. And uh, just go to sleep for hours and hours and hours. Um, whereas sometimes it can be helpful just to 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 put forth a bit of effort and 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 push ourselves a little bit be beyond what we think is uh, comfortable. Um, Again, it's 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 finding a balance. Uh, but being willing to to rise up and to put forth energy. Sometimes really what's needed is just um, maybe a, a change of practice. You know, sometimes we we can we can get very um dull, very sleepy, very lethargic. Um, and that's, that sometimes comes from boredom. You know, we're just bored with whatever it is that we've been doing, whatever practice it is that we've been doing. And nobody's asking us to just do the same kind of meditation, you know, sitting for hours and hours and hours. You know, the Buddha gave so many different strategies, so many different techniques I mean, even just getting up and standing for 10 minutes, that can bring energy into the system. Or doing some walking meditation. Uh, doing a bit of study. You know, contemplating a teaching. You know, there are many ways that we can, we can in, infuse energy into our lives, into our practice. Uh, sometimes we, we can become very hungry for, for peace. And so we get very, very peaceful. And we just meditate, 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 get very, very peaceful, and then just get very, very sleepy and dozy. And that's something to watch out for. Uh, sometimes in our practice, we actually need to generate energy. So to watch out for that. As I said, if we don't have much energy, there may be a medical basis for this. Maybe we haven't had enough rest. Maybe we've, maybe we're actually not well. Um, but it may just be that we, we need to, um, be a little bit more playful, a little bit more inventive, uh, with our approach to practice. That's allowed. That's allowed. Maybe doing some chanting. You know, we're not able to chant right now together as a group, which is something that I miss greatly, but, you know, I do chant around the field. I do chant when I go out walking. I do chant in my kuti a lot. And that's also very good for generating energy. You know, finding a chant that you really like and just chanting full volume. <laughs> Uh, you can do that if you're alone. Apparently there's a place somewhere up the lane. I'm not quite sure where it is, but in, in the old days, uh, when uh, it must have been way back in the 80s when we first came here, 80s and 90s, uh, early 90s, and when some of the nuns, when they used to get really frustrated, they used to find this, go to this place, and they used to scream because they knew that no one could hear them. So uh, that might be somewhere to go if you if you need to chant full volume. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's probably a secret I shouldn't be passing on. 
about the old days. Um, and then being easy to support, not a burden. Yeah. I've thought about this one because, um, you know, sometimes uh, we may have many needs. Um, you know, as 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 summoners, um, and it applies equally for for lay lay folk, lay people. You know, sometimes you know when we're sick, we we need an enormous amount of help, an enormous amount of care. Uh, So how can we be easy to support and not a burden? You know, my sense is that uh, one of the things that makes us easy to support is a sense of appreciation and gratitude uh, towards those who are supporting us. And it's not something that we ever take for granted. Always a sense of appreciation. Um, as a nun, I try to, you know, if people say, what can I offer you? I try to really think carefully, you know, do I really need anything? And often I don't really need anything. Um, and if I do need something, then... Um, finding a way just to um, ask for it, you know, and if the person has asked, if they want to provide something, then um, we can ask and it can be provided in a sense of gratitude, a sense of appreciation. And then people are happy to support us. I mean, I notice myself if, you know, if, if I can offer something and if people are grateful, if they appreciate it, it's, it, it, it's very lovely. I'm glad to do it, it's, it's, not, it's not a problem. I remember um, when we used to look after Sister Upala, and there's not many people here who will remember Sister Upala. In fact, probably just Ajahn Sundara. <laughs> we used to look after Sister Upala, and she was always so grateful. And uh, she did an enormous amount of care, uh, especially as she as she got older. And uh, she she could be very demanding, very difficult. But there was also a sense of gratitude. And so it was a joy to take care of her. Uh, we're encouraged to consider carefully what we need and uh, not to ask for more, not to be demanding. Um, but as I said, this doesn't mean that we can't ask for things if we need them. Um, but realizing that this being easy to support or being a burden is much more about our inner attitude than about actually the, the quality or the quantity of things um, that might be needed. So these are the um, guidelines that the Buddha gave for Mahapajapati so that she could go and she could practice on her own, diligent, ardent, and resolute. Just to recap uh, ways that we can think, questions we can ask ourselves, uh, does this practice lead to dispassion? What a passion. Does it lead to being free, not bound? Does it lead to self-effacement, not to self-aggrandizement? Does it lead to modesty, not to ambition? Does it lead to contentment? not to discontent? Does it lead to solitude? 
not to sociability or entanglement? Does it lead to putting forth of energy, not to indolence? Does it lead to being easy to support, not a burden? So if that's the case, then you can know you're heading in the right direction. But please don't beat yourself up if you notice any of the opposite happening, but rather use it as a something to be curious about, something to investigate, something to learn from. Because that's what we're all here for. We're all here to learn. And practice is about learning, learning how to live in the best possible way in order to free the heart from every kind of suffering. So I offer this as an encouragement to us all this evening. May we all be perfectly liberated in this very lifetime. Amen.